Let me erase and delete. Okay. Erased and deleted. And are we recording? Yep, we're recording again now. I feel like Dave and Joel doing the claps like the old days. Oh, just trying to send a smaller file. Yeah, exactly. Me. We don't need outtakes or highlight reels or anything. Nope. All right. It's Monday, April 13th, 2020. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, we are talking about Postgres or PostgreSQL, the database you should probably be using. <gasps> All right. Uh, Opening bits. Guess I got one. So I've been live streaming myself playing DDR. I've done it a few times now. And is I finally... anyone watching that? Yeah, but it's Why? interesting. Well, some people come in. To, You're uh, not particularly good at DDR. I'm pretty or, good. I mean, you know, you're in the same zone that we're both at with most video games, which is better than most people, but not remotely good as the really good people. So, we're, you know, it's like you could; those people are, like, interesting to watch because of their amazing Well, pizza. one thing I've noticed is that I was looking around at other people who are live streaming DDR, and there aren't many because it's kind of hard to do not. well. Most oh, of yeah. the DDR streams have a decent number of viewers, but... Like, they look like garbage. They're, like, super out of sync, or, like, the audio sounds really bad, or it's, like, a webcam in a dark room pointed at Well, the best feet. DDR videos are recorded videos, right? Not, uh... Yep. Not but, like, people stream. just, like, live streaming, like, hey, I'm playing fourth mix right now. Tune in. They're just all pretty bad. But also, most of the streams I found are people who are either on an arcade machine holding on to the bar even if they're really good, or they've made a fucking bar for their home pad and they're holding on to that. Mm -hmm. So because I'm doing bar lists, I got a few viewers. It's pretty fun, but the most fun thing is getting random requests like, hey, do Max 300 because I can pass most of the weird shit people try to make me do. But I am definitely too old to ever pass Max 300 again. Holy shit. Maybe if you use the bar. <laughs> well, the bar doesn't help me because I just... I can walk around the pad, and I can pass Max 300 if I do the first half and the second half separately. I am too old to do the whole song in one go. My legs just run out of steam, and I, I just fall over about two-thirds of the way through it. I think there's harder songs than that now. Though, oh, yeah, right? there's Legend of Max, which I can get about halfway through. I'm there's... saying there's even harder songs than that. There have been so many DDR versions. Oh, yeah, there's the, the, what we would consider a nine-footer from the old days. If you, they, they changed the foot system, but there's basically the equivalent of, like, 15-footers now. Mm. But they're not fun to watch anyone do. It's just fanboy piston. Yeah. But uh, getting the stream synced to where the two cameras pointed at my at me and my feet, plus the audio, plus uh, Step Mania, getting those all in sync is a fucking nightmare because there is no good synchronization tools for non-professional video equipment. Like, good the Lord. The best synchronization that I've found for someone streaming or recording stuff at home is to simply send the audio through one of the cameras. Yep, but if you because have multiple least, cameras, you got to sync those. But yeah, you definitely... Right, why well, if multiple cameras, you would simply have, hopefully, the primary best camera would be the one with the audio going through it. Yep. Right, And if you switch to a different camera, well, then that one's out of sync. But I right? don't have a good way to plug my real fancy camera into OBS yet because I don't have a good video capture card. But I think uh, I'm going to buy... The one that I sent, the one that I, uh, sent you. Though. I'm going to buy one of those janky uh, bootleg-looking RTMP encoders and just stick it on my camcorder. Well, oh, well, that, yeah, that's for that, but, you know. Because then I can if, use if that, the... If that works, I want one also. <laughs> yep, I'm going to get, like, a cheapo one because, from what I can tell, the cheap ones are kind of dodgy and probably are not paying for the right licenses for their like whatever codex they have. The cheap one was two it was less two hundred dollars or less. And the one that actually looked like totally legit super good was close to like seventeen hundred dollars. Yep. So it's like this and there weren't a lot of products on the market. So if I break <laughs> one every six months, it's still cheaper to get the crappy one. Because <laughs> it Maybe. seems like the primary problem with the crappy ones is they'll just randomly break or die and they're kind of fragile. Even even the Cerevo Live Shell X, I saw people complaining that uh, sometimes their cloud service is down, sometimes and sometimes yeah. the battery that's in it is not great. That's the thing. It's uh, like some domains, like when I buy audio equipment, like there are if the, the pro versions, the reason why they cost so much is that they just work. Like they just work. You don't have to worry about it. The support is great. But the problem is those pro ones do so much more stuff. Yeah, I don't need that, like four way cell bonding. Right, that we don't need. I wish the pro one. It's like all we need is a device that takes HDMI in, 
as HDMI out it, so that for for um you know connecting to like a monitor yep. or right remove and HDCP then, just in case. Sure, it needs to take whatever video was on that HDMI and then encode it and send it to, via Wi-Fi or Ethernet to an arbitrary RTMP destination to to an arbitrary RTMP URL at 1080p 60. That's all it has to do. Yep. It doesn't need any other feature. The only configuration should be the Wi-Fi connection. Right, SSID and info for that, and the RTMP URL <laughs> and RTMP authentication. Like, I don't stuff. even care if like the color is bad or really anything. Yeah, no, it. I mean, uh, people were actually complaining that like the Live Shell X, the color is bad. Like, ah. it, it doesn't get to white; it only gets to gray, and it doesn't get to black; it only gets to dark gray. But see, that's what I'm talking about. It's one thing if there's a really expensive version, but it is perfect and just works, but it's just way too expensive. If the expensive option also has people complaining about it, that space is not mature yet. That wasn't the, the Live Shell X is 700. The 1700, the, that one a thousand dollars more is the one that has no problem. Yep. At least I had discre- I uh I restrained myself from buying because I needed new monitor speakers. I got the ones that were appropriate to the size of this room, as opposed to the ones that I wanted to get. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, there's definitely you know you look at the market for any sort of electronic stuff, and there's always things that are made for houses and large rooms, big TVs, yep. you know, all this kind of stuff. And when you live in a tiny apartment. You know, even though those products are awesome when in a, in a vacuum, they're not awesome in a tiny room without a lot of space. Yep, so I did. saved $300 by having 50 total watts of output power in this tiny room instead of 250 watts. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, got any news? Do I have news? Well, this, first of all, is you know, uh, I guess virus-ish related news. You may have seen this is that uh, various states are looking for COBOL programmers because there's a lot of unemployment right now. Yep. And all the unemployment systems are written in COBOL. And you're thinking, well, okay, first of all, you know, we need to talk about why it's still, they haven't replaced that system. Yeah, there's a lot. But there's, while there's a lot, mostly bad reasons why, there are surprisingly good reasons in some cases. Oh, yeah, plenty of good reasons. But the... The fact is that those are still the systems in use. People go to work and they're looking at some cruddy old terminal yep. and connecting to this old database that still works and still gets <laughs> the job done and still people get their unemployment checks. And you think, well, why do they need programmers? This this system has been there. It's working. It's working so well since 1960. Who knows yep. how old the but thing there were is. more unemployment claims in the last like two weeks than in like entire quarters in recent sure, history. Sure, sure. But it's not about the pro you don't need programming to increase the mm -hmm. capacity necessarily. Why do you need programming? Because they change the law. Yeah. That's why, right? The law goes from some legislators' hands. They vote on it. And when they change unemployment law, say to give everyone an extra six hundred dollars you have to change the code in the COBOL system to match the law. Now, that is an area where I actually have a, a lot of expertise. Because as you know, my day job is in capital markets. And capital markets have extreme regulations in some cases. So, like, a law will happen, and then an entire global industry has to implement that law in code within, like, a couple years. But unlike every other sector in the entire global economy... Uh, capital Markets has a shit ton of engineering resources available, and they just do it. But even then, it's a pain because laws are written in a way that is not necessarily that easy to transform into code. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But outside of Capital Markets, you can't just hire like $100,000, $300,000 a year engineers to solve this problem. You don't have enough money to do that. Right. You might be thinking, well, you could find a COBOL guy to figure out this old, not only to know COBOL, but to figure out this old busted system and update it without breaking it. Right. And get it to get the law changes in there. Yep. Right. It's like, OK, you could do that, which is what you're going to do. It's like, well, why not just rewrite the whole thing in some modern thing? OK, well, the even if you were going to pay people to do that, you're like, OK, let's do the right thing and replace this old cruddy system. Right. The you have to a. How much institutional knowledge is in that old code? Yep. Right? That old system is calculating things correctly, right? Regardless of how busted it is, it's doing it right. So you need to build a system 
And based on just knowledge that people have that you can talk to, right, they might not be able to explain things to you. They might forget things. Things they say might be wrong. And the, the system is right. You have to match. It's a reverse engineer every single edge case in that old system to make your system correct. Even worse, just, you have to do it. That process in a... alone, right? will take you so long <laughs> that you'll still be using the COBOL one for years. And even worse, all that aside, the old systems uh, are more like normal engineering, which is something that most software does not follow. Like the, the practices of real engineering is not something that most code in the world follows. That's why code has a lot of bugs and a lot of issues. Software like this cannot have bugs. You cannot just use like the kinds of frameworks and the kinds of data structures and the kinds of validations that most programmers use in most code that they write. You have to write I mean, things... you say that, but from what I've heard, most of these old COBOL systems for this kind of thing are just spaghetti code. Yeah, from but it's often 30, spaghetti code ago. that will have like multiple verification paths. The problem is it'll be three spaghetti it's paths. Correct, it's correct spaghetti code, yep. but it's it's not good. But they tend to have right. multiple paths of verification, which it's, is something yeah, it's that... Yeah, it's not that... I mean, you might get that with code for like space shuttles yeah. and medical devices, but not for unemployment systems. Yeah, it or depends. Or insurance systems, right? But uh, it's also sort of a more broader picture that I've realized more and more as the scale of what I do during my day job increases and like the number of systems and like the things I interact with have, has grown over the years. But one thing that's really become abundantly clear is that enterprise doesn't just mean shitty interfaces and garbage software. I mean, that that is a big part of the word enterprise. But enterprise also really... Like, this is enterprise. Enterprise means that you're writing software or code or systems that work on a scale that is beyond what 99.9% .9 of all people will ever interact with. Mm -hmm. Just the number of stakeholders, number of users, the use cases, the constraints. Like it's a it's a totally different discipline. It's almost like there's a there's a computer science dif discipline and a software engineering discipline, and you almost need like a scaled software engineering discipline that follows a different path through schooling and education. Mm. But yeah, like the system that we've been replacing at my work for the past, however long yep. that we still haven't, we're, you know, we're get it's, it's not nearly as complicated. I'm sure. Right. We're making a lot of progress. We are going to replace it. And, but the reason that it's a good idea is because a, the old system is actually not COBOL. It's like Microsoft SQL Server. Oh, God. So like it's... Oh, God. Is there just like database trigger, like stored procedures in there? Oh, all kinds of garbage like that, yeah. Uh, you want to you know, give me a 1,000-yard stare, awful. say the word stored procedure with, with business logic in it. It's less awful than COBOL, so it's like we can sort of, you know, figure it out. Yep. But the other thing is that unlike the unemployment system situation right the system we're replacing is actually often wrong right uh, so it's not a matter it's not a matter of this thing is right it's a matter of this is the thing everyone uses it's right enough we cannot right rep by replacing it not only are we fixing all of its flaws but we're gonna we have the opportunity to do better right so with you don't have that opportunity with these cobalt systems to do better than them yep right as much there isn't that much room and there isn't like a some motive for doing better really you know? yep. the cost of a lift and shift of this kind of thing is right your hope like your hope for the unemployment system is to never have to is to like the goal is for it to go away like right? whatever so yeah. no one's unemployed like whatever you out there if you don't work in enterprise scale like whatever you think it would cost to do this kind of thing within one firm Raise it by an order of magnitude and then double it and that's probably a low end estimate of the actual real cost. Yeah, but I don't recommend you learn COBOL. No, the no, no, one no. The one time I heard of someone um, replacing an old system was someone who worked at uh, an, an insur a big insurance company in the city that had an old busted system. And the way that they were escaping that system is they were screen reading from a terminals to get the data out. Ooh, I've done, I, I've implemented things like that before. Right? So they were like, you know, using a virtual terminal protocol to connect right to the system right and inter basically the, the new system was interacting with the old system as a user would because it's right? not like the old system has an ethernet port <laughs> right exactly uh and then they were getting the data out that way right um 
So that, you know, and that required no, basically almost no knowledge of the old system other than how to use a terminal. Yep. Right? But emulator. COBOL is definitely on its way out. But in general, like my career too, like here's a fun example. I'm one of the global experts in the fixed protocol. It's some old busted stuff, but people need it. You will never go wrong by learning and becoming the expert in old, boring, weird bullshit that nobody wants to deal with. Because right, well, by that we don't. I don't necessarily mean a language like COBOL, but with some old, boring, weird shit would be like a specific, you know, technology yeah. or product. Like right, that has to be something that's actually used in an industry. Yeah, like knowing COBOL is not right? the important part. Understanding how systems like this work is the hard part. Right. So, for example, like there's some specialized product that everyone in industry X uses to do a particular thing in the world, right? It's like, oh, there are people trading, I don't know, commodities, right? Yep. All the commodities traders probably have a thing that they use. Yep. That's like the commodities trading thing. Learn that and thing and either be... If you become the master of that thing, you're good. You don't even need to be a programmer. You could just be a BA, like a business analyst. If you... There are people who make as much money as me and Scott, and they don't write any code. Their sole job is to understand, explain, and document complex systems based on research and their own just knowledge and intelligence. Right. Well, that's also a large part of the problem is these old COBOL systems. They were, like I said, spaghetti code, yep. but also not documented from a developer standpoint. Yep. If they were, right, if there's any documentation, which there probably isn't, it's from a user standpoint, like how to use, right? Like you have to enter someone's claim. Here's how to do it, right? Yep. But what's going on behind the scenes? Mysteries. Mysteries. So in some other news that's very sad and tragic, I knew he died and I felt bad about it because he was he was like over 80, like he was old. I, I at one point years ago, I was surprised he was still alive. But uh, COVID-19 claimed the life of John Conway, who is what a very, very important person when it comes to computer science and other fields. Mm -hmm. John Conway also, like, not that I knew him or anything, but, you know, sometimes there's a an important person who's also a dick or has problems. As far as I can tell, John Conway seemed like mostly a really cool person. Yeah, John Conway, basically, it's like, you know, it's like you, everyone knows, like, the game of life. But, like, the amount of things that he worked on that are, like, significant, and it's yep. like, oh, that thing. What oh, did, okay, what the Guardian, wow. I found a quote here. The Guardian in his, uh, basically, the eulogy, they said, John Conway is a cross between Archimedes, Mick Jagger, and Salvador Dali. That's pretty much correct, yeah. For many years, he was worried that his obsession with playing silly games was ruining his career until he realized that it could lead to extraordinary discoveries. <laughs> so... Uh, pour one out for John Conway. He's uh, he's an important person, and if you can find videos of his lectures and talks and just stuff he's done, it's all fascinating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in some other news, uh, Sc this is a Scott news, but it's up my alley. I didn't, I wasn't paying attention to this one because I don't set clocks anymore. I have people to do that for <laughs> me. I have not touched NTP in three point two years. All right, I'm not going to get into the specifics of this because uh, I'll be wrong, and it's because it's about quantum mechanics. And I'm and reading this article right now, so I'll see what I can. <laughs> but the basic the basic gist is that there's an atomic clock that works somehow by uh, quantum, you know, check like charging a particle and then checking what charge level the electrons are at or something, and it makes a it makes a very very accurate clock. Uh, what but the because fuck? okay, I'm reading this article. This is what the fuck. But because the clock works on, you know, such a, um, a quantum level, right? It obeys the theory of relativity. So if you push, if you pick up the clock and carry it away from the Earth, right? It will on its own naturally, right? Speed up or slow down, right? I guess all clocks do that technically. They see, I'm already wrong. <laughs> the well, point is, time the clock is, is relative. So so, yes. The, the point is that the clock is so precise, right, that it, you can use it as an altimeter, right? So if you go, whoa, if you were to gravitationally it, induced frequency shift, the right. the frequency of this thing shifted by twenty one hertz at a distance, an elevation change of what four hundred and fifty meters? What the right. fuck? So you, if you were to bring it up the Empire State Building, you could theoretically tell how tall the Empire State Building is based on how much this clock has, I don't know, slowed down or sped up. 
The clock is, you can use this clock alone <laughs> as an altimeter that's accurate to within 10 centimeters. To, to yes. Look at your watch, run up a building, look at your watch again, and then be able to say just from what you saw on the watch how tall that building is. That's yeah, how much less How much less gravity there is up there than down here, because there is less, right? Up there? Uh, L- yes. Less, less gravity up there. Yeah, right? because so, of inverse square yeah. laws. The further away you get from something, the gravitational yeah. influence drops off rapidly. However, it does never hit zero. Right, so normally the an atomic clock like this would be so valuable and so fragile that you would keep it in a room, not move it, connect it to the internet so everyone could take advantage of its extra precise time. But yeah, they basically put it in several boxes in the back of a, Honda a Civic. vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> This so, is just cool go. stuff. Uh, but yeah, I don't set clocks anymore. NTP works fine, but... Uh, no, if you did set a clock, you'd set it against that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would set it against a static uh, atomic clock, I think, still. I don't know. That one seems pretty good to me. This one, uh, I got to read more about this thing because this article is more funny than directly informative, but uh, this yeah. is cool. Mm. All right. So last but definitely not least... Uh, one thing that the global pandemic has shown is that very few people have reasonable solutions for doing like online meetings with more than like two people. Yeah, I mean, you know, we I'm sure you've already read all about how Zoom sucks, yep. right? But I I want people don't seem to realize why did Zoom become a big hit? And it's because there were no other products out there that were free, accessible to everyone on on almost every platform that did exactly what it does. There are tons of video conferencing, video chat solutions, right? And most of them are better than Zoom. But for example, FaceTime. FaceTime, which was, I'm still mad at Apple about this. Go back and watch the keynote where they announced FaceTime and said it would be an open protocol that anyone could build FaceTime. I thought there was going to be FaceTime on Windows and on everything, Android, everything. And there wasn't. There still isn't. I would have used it. They straight out lied like the president. They straight out lied. But FaceTime is the best video, you know, consumer video chat solution there is. Yep. You can need an Apple device to use it. Right. So that's right out. Right. So that can't beat Zoom, which runs on everything. Yep. And there's uh, a lot of great solutions, but they're all enterprisey or cost money. Right. Or are even Google Meet, difficult Google to set Meet up. which my company uses, you need to have a Google you know, company account and all the people have to be on it. So you can use it at your company. If your company uses Google, you know, Microsoft teams or whatever, you got to have a company that uses Microsoft teams. That's not something that someone at home can use with their friends. Zoom was also designed for companies to use, to run little video chats. Right. But it was free to try and set up. You can have a 40 minute chat for free or something like that. Then it times you out and you start another one. (laughs) Um, And it, Everyone can just download it for free, use it for free, and it did the grid display, right? The other chats did not do grid displays. They did, you know, switch to whoever's talking. Yep. They did all sorts of other, you know, you know, FaceTime does like a picture in picture. You know, the, thing. the technology we use at work is proprietary. Like we, we paid a company to build it for us, but it has a really good model where it'll line everyone up at the bottom, but it'll only show like the 10 or so recent people who talked, but then... Yeah, some of Google does. Yeah. yeah, and if anyone talks, they come up in the big screen, and then they kind of settle back into the array of people who recently talked. Yeah, that's what most, you know, bi- as for business cases, that's what you want, because in a business case, you know, s- there's usually some people talking and a lot of people listening yep. and maybe occasionally asking a question or chiming in. But if you're chatting with all your friends, right, you want this party atmosphere, yep. right? The grid view is actually better for that social arrangement where even if someone doesn't talk you see their face always there you you know you feel like you're there with them you get their reactions yep right you know what they're up to you can see their environment you know the business one that wouldn't be so great for that kind of kind of thing you'd only ever see the chatty people like rim yeah other people you would be like were they even on the chat i don't know you wouldn't feel that togetherness so that is why piece of shit garbage zoom took over uh, but obviously it sucks. It has security issues, privacy issues. It's just a piece of shit, really. Uh, but there isn't anything else. So well, that's why... there wasn't anything else until this update as of Dateline today. <laughs> oh, okay. So Discord, which not Discord is not perfect. However, I trust Discord a lot more than I trust Zoom. 
Uh, uh, sure. Yeah. Like I use okay. Discord. Low bar, but yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, it's a low bar, but like <laughs> we are flying high above that bar with Discord, even though there still are problems there. Like I want there to be more open solutions for this kind of thing. You know, back when Web 2.0 existed, I miss those days. But anyway, Discord is right now, they have rolled out a feature that basically does all this stuff in 5% of Discord servers out in the wild for free. It's just there. And they're testing it, and they're going to roll it out to everyone else on a schedule to be determined. There's a fact here. I'm, like, literally just looking at this because it's brand new. It looks basically perfect. Yeah. And I mean, you know, they were already positioned to build something. I was surprised they didn't have it already, right? They already do voice chat. I would. I suspect they were already sharing. working on this and just hadn't rolled it out yet, and then coronavirus happened. Yeah, probably. Because I remember way back, we were at a PAX, and we were already angsting about, like, we got to get off of Google Hangouts because we can't trust Google. They're starting to, like, destroy all their services. The Discord's not perfect, but I guess that's what we'll use for now. But right? I remember we talked to some Discord people, and they, that was back when they were really trying to pitch, like, hey, we exist. Check us out. And they, yep. like, they like in person really aggressively, like, yeah, forget your, forget your forum. Put all your community in our Discord. We'll help you out. And we, Scott was very like, yeah, I don't trust you. I don't trust them at all. I still don't trust them. Why are they making money? Uh, well, they make money. The, the thing is, they do have a direct revenue stream, the boost. Sure, but. Yeah, but I don't think that makes them enough money to survive. I still think they're basically living on borrowed Silicon Valley time, yeah, just like everyone else. I think they are, but there is a difference. Like, a, a, there's a meaningful difference because, of course, there's differences of degree everywhere. But I do think when it comes to these kinds of companies, I'm not saying Discord is great uh, from this perspective, but a company that has zero sources of direct revenue versus a company that has at least one real used source of direct revenue. Like Twitter has no direct revenue. They can only make money by betraying you and selling ads. But at least mm. Discord has a way to pay them directly for stuff. I will always trust a company I can pay with money over a company where there is literally no way to pay them with anything but stealing my soul, getting my information, spying on me, selling me ads. Sure. Uh, whatever. Discord might yeah, be the best option main, you'll my have. My main problem with Discord is that you know you know it's uh, uh, gonna die. Yeah, everything's Someday. gonna die. And I've I've lived through so but, many but social networks. Other, but I was able to. We ran our own data. alternative to Twitter with our friends at one point right. for years. Uh, but I can preserve all of my data from all of those. Yep. But not at Discord. It is much harder to back up a Discord. Yep. I have a uh, log of every archive. chat I have ever had online with anyone ever going back to the year 1997. Mine's not that comprehensive, but I mean, I have a lot of chat logs going way back. I I, the, I have I can go back. The first thing I ever said to Scott online, we uh, I met. He messaged me and he was like, "Hey, I was the guy who was at the anime club," and I was like, "Oh yeah, yeah." You want to meet at Gracie's for dinner? And Scott was like, "Sure." And that was the first time we met outside of the context of anime club and Arwag. Yeah, I wasn't sure because it was sort of like I guess we were at an anime club. And you I went to I an anime talked. club and I wasn't there because I skipped the first. Yeah, but anime I mean, club. I guess I. Oh no, that's what it was. It was the. Um, it wasn't actually the anime club. It was Arwag. the D and D at Arwag with Dan yes. and Dwayne. Yes. Yeah, it was after that's that, that session where we we right. rolled up characters for that game, and then the like next... I was in that game as I was alone, and then. But then I kept seeing you, you know, a very distinctive mustache hat person. Yep. And you stood out because you and Katsu were talking about, like, I just kept overhearing proper nouns I cared about, like Battletech something something. Yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> but I have anyway. detailed records of every conversation online I've ever had going back to that moment. Mm -hmm. And it annoys me that there isn't just, like, a good API for me to scrape and archive everything that I've ever said on any Discord ever. Yeah, you should. Discord should have a thing where a server administrator can save as and download the you know, entire uh, logs of every channel on the server. You know, and as a Discord user, you should be able to download and save as and text files all of your DMs. You know, that IRC like thing that Tracy uses with Discord does log everything. Right, but that's logging things as they come through. Yep. You, but if we just ran you, something like that forever... You'd have to run something to go back, though, and get all the old chats. Yeah. Might just have to start from now, but at least then we'd have everything from now onward. I don't know how it works. I haven't looked at yep. it. Anyway, last but certainly not least, this is some fascinating news. I don't know if we ever talked about Brian Swords of York on Geek Nights. I feel like it was a thing we of the day. Have. 
it had to have been a thing of the day, but you might have seen this YouTube video that made the rounds years ago. Long time ago. We're so cool because we knew about this before it was cool. And if you were a pro, you might have seen this on TV in the 80s. Uh, no one's that pro. <gasps> Someone had to be. But anyway, there was basically, there was a PBS auction. There's, I'll link to an article. I'm not going to tell the whole story. But this auction had like a bunch of random crack to raise money for PBS. But... One of the things that kept coming up is there was this person named Brian Swords who lived in York, and Brian drew uh, anthropomorphic erotica, but tasteful anthropomorphic erotica. And that's the kind of thing that could just be on a PBS auction. Like, like he donated his artworks to support the local public television yep. channel, and they auctioned them off and made money to keep showing you Sesame Street. Yep, and there was this just... Like, compilation of YouTube of every time one of his art pieces appeared in these auctions, uh, the commentators, like, not making fun of it, they were just like, oh, yeah, and here's a piece of art. Oh, it's, uh, looks like it's two rats, and they're having a good time. This is a, this is an interesting piece. And they would just talk about it, and it's just like this really, really obvious furry erotica just hanging out on PBS in the 90s. So... Mm-hmm. Fast forward 80s, 90s, 80s and 90s. This 1992 is the okay. year of the one that most people know, the smell of wet fur. Okay. So fast forward to uh, Dateline Today. Uh, many of you might have seen like rumblings of this, but if you're not aware, John Oliver of Last Week Tonight, a, fa- a very important human being who I love dearly, has purchased... The actual original one that is most commonly known from Brian Swords of York. He has it. Uh, there's a picture of him holding the original painting. It is done. Yeah, it was, uh, I guess, somehow he found out about Brian Swords of York. And he tweeted. He was just like, hey, it. does anyone know a Brian Swords of York? I would like yep. to purchase his art. I want to track this down. Yeah. And how he got the someone sold it to him. Yeah, so. apparently it's cool. We know some people who are closer to Brian Sword's uh, orbit than I expected. Mm-hmm. So I almost want a framed picture of John Oliver holding this framed picture. Okay, <laughs> he looks sure. so delighted with himself. That was your thing of the day. Uh no, that was just some news. But anyway, I guess oh. it is time for. <laughs> Things of the day. So what do you got? So uh, we were talking lately about all kinds of Animal Crossing biz, and it people are like posting online all kinds of crazy stuff that is like hard to believe because of like how the turnip market works and all this other stuff, right? And it's like, how did you figure this stuff out? With, like data, mo- you know, yeah, it's like, game hasn't been out that can... long, and it's not like an and ADS of... ROM where you can dump the whole thing out and like read it in yeah. per- like you yeah, just and a read lot it. of people have posted stuff that's wrong right or not quite exactly right so i can't trust them necessarily so apparently uh i didn't realize how far it had come i knew there was switch you know homebrew stuff right but here is a link to like the actual switch homebrews you know peoples is my thing of the day because they have come way further in switch homebrew than i had uh, realized uh, you can do some crazy stuff with Switch Homebrew, and apparently, uh, if you do things correctly, it will not impair your ability to connect to Switch Online or uh, run legit games correctly. Uh, I would still personally recommend only doing this on like a spare Switch. Maybe grab a Switch Lite and do it to that, uh, uh, just in case. You never know, right? Yep. How, how cautious you are with your... Because Nintendo you know, your... is not Sony bad, but Nintendo is the, right. oh, I guess you bricked yourself, sorry. Right, but they are doing some phenomenal things, and they have the actual, like, supposed source code to the Turnip Market was posted. That could obviously change at any time with a version update to the game, but that's supposedly the code that's being run right now. And there are several websites that you type in your current prices, and they pr- tell you, you know, what your prices could be coming up in the future. So, uh, yeah, if you're someone who's interested in some homebrewing, running other software on your Switch, Maybe even pirating games if that's possible. You know, do changing your Switch home screen to suck less. No. <laughs> it's it's kind of mad. <laughs> uh, that's that's like the one major thing you can do. You know, there's all kinds of crazy good stuff you can do. Write your own software to run on your Switch. You know, maybe play some Doom on there without buying it in the eShop. Yeah, I mean, I bought it in the eShop, but I would I want to run a Doom that can play remotely with other people. The killer no. fucking app. Why can no one ever do the obvious thing on a Nintendo platform? Right, make your own Switch software. I'm sure is easily possible with this, right? Yeah. Uh, 
This yeah, is a so, very yeah. detailed and cool guide, too. Yeah, no, the, it's like actually like totally legit. Uh, it's not legit. It's <laughs> unlegit. But but uh, it's you know, legit. It, it works. It legit in that it works, not that it is legal. So my thing of the day, I was watching this over the weekend. I watched the beginning of it, but uh, Apollo 13 in real time. This is some cool ass shit. So basically, you go to this website, and NASA has all the video, all the audio, all the transcripts, photography, everything from the entire Apollo 13 mission. All this of is it. why we need to save all the chat from Discord yeah. so we can do rec- right. So what they've done, and you can go right now and watch this uh, because it's the anniversary of Apollo 13. They are replaying all of it in a really complex website. You can be like, like in real time as the events happened so long ago. So you can log in right now and be like, at this on this date at this time, what was the like the person responsible for the thrusters saying to anyone in Mission Control? I want to see what the video was in like the secondary Mission Control Center. I want to get commentary. Yep. All the different people at the Mission Control in Houston, all you know, and it's real time. Like if you watch the movie, like it feels like it was a pretty compressed thing. Apollo thirteen went down over. A lot longer period of time than you realize. It is not until yeah, fifty. It didn't take ninety minutes. <laughs> it is fifty-six hours in is when the famous phrase that haunting Houston, we have a problem happens. Right. Imagine if the movie was fifty-six hours long. Yeah. So You'd be asleep. I watched the entire launch because it's just amazing to see. But you can also for fast forward, rewind. Like you can jump to segments. Like if you want to see a particularly interesting bit, this is amazing and if you don't understand what's going on there is a shockingly in-depth text commentary that is time synced to the entire thing that explains everything like every acronym Mm -hmm. at one point they were like this guy sounds really boring right it sounds like knowing's paying attention to him right and then it goes on to explain what that guy was saying and why he had to say it in the boring way he did and what purpose that served and it's just pages and pages of this fascinating stuff Stuff like this is super important, simply not from the perspective of just, you know, space, yep. but also just history. If you look, people talk about like pre-recorded history, right? Where we're, we're doing archaeology and guessing, yep. right? Recorded history where it's like, oh yeah, we have some writings of people in 1700 or whatever. Yeah. But it's like, it's not, you know, there's so much, you know, guesswork and interpretation. Well, like and Romans, other the things. earliest historians, uh, some of the things that they wrote down are plausible, However, not likely. <laughs> right, exactly. So like, I don't think there were 100,000 soldiers at that battle, dude. <laughs> this kind of detailed recorded history, right, is basically as close to an objective, complete recording of at least one zoomed-in area at one yep. zoomed-in time that you can have. To where, like, if you sent this to someone in the distant, distant future... They would have basically, other than maybe not knowing our language, once they get past that, right, sort of thing. Yep. There would be no question about what was what happened, right? And, and this, why was this event special? What was this event? What was happening? What were people doing, right? Yep. As long as you had basic understanding of like these are people. Yep. And it also really gives this perspective of like people think about Apollo 13 and the astronauts themselves, but. The number of people involved in a 10-second sequence where one engine has to do one thing, I don't think people understand how big the Apollo program was as a project. The number Mm -hmm. of people involved is staggering and difficult to internalize. You need a lot more people. Yep. But also just like... There's a lot, even with modern computers, modern space launches still require a terrifying number of people. Oh, yes. So this is just so cool, and I'm going to continue to watch choice bits from it. But also, it, it would be a lot harder to watch movie, if I didn't yeah. know how this ended. Because it's not a movie, all the dramatization is removed. Yeah. So you can see what is it's really like for real. But real, real. it's real. like when the problem happens, like you see some people kind of freak out, like in the video in the background, and like it's yep. you can hear like the fear in their eyes because even watching the movie, like as dramatized as it is, we all know how it ended. But there... Mm-hmm. Like, at the early parts of the disaster, no one thought they were coming home. Right. There's also a difference between a real person freaking out for real and an actor acting as if they're freaked out. The people on the ground were freaking out way more than the astronauts. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Otherwise, met a moment. (laughs) We're currently not reading The Tale of Genji because we don't have commutes or free time. 
<laughs> Maybe I'll read some. I don't know. I feel like I will as it gets a little warmer. Like I'm gonna when I go for a long bike ride, I might like stop in an empty part of a park somewhere and read a little bit. We'll see. Mm-hmm. But I'm mostly, you know, it's weird. I have this illusion of free time in that because I'm working from home every day and because of the way the world is, I have this sense that I have more free time. But the reality is... You gain a is, little bit of free time by not commuting. Yeah, that saves me 22 minutes a weekday. That's it. That's I've gained all. a little bit more free time by not showering. Yep. But I don't actually... Not only <laughs> do I not have more free time, but I picked up all these projects because I'm stuck at home and those projects are actually taking up more time. I have less free time now than I did before the disaster. I made a significant progress on the ma- redoing the Geek Nights website technology. I am... Uh, I've also spent a lot of time cooking because it used to be, oh, I just got home. I don't really want to cook now. Yep. Let's, right, let's now eat out. Oh, I got all this time. Let me cook. Yeah, well, cooking takes time. That yeah. now. I got some roasted root vegetables in there that I got to go tend to at some point. I got to make some chili. Uh, right. All the cleaning I used to put off, I'm cleaning. So. Yep. Just not myself. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't actually have more free time, but we are doing a ton of projects. So stay tuned. Like our YouTube channels and like all our biz, we are actively progressing on a lot of real projects. Uh, stay tuned. Like we're not taking this time idly geek nights is going to bust out with more and more content but yeah, right now we're focused on process and infrastructure it's just yeah i'm constantly doing stuff it's just it's got to get to done before anyone can see it yep. right? i also started building a hurdy-gurdy kit and uh that's taken some time oh you got it okay oh i'm already i've built a good chunk of it but now i'm glad i am far away from it now i'm at the hard part stringing that thing i do not look forward to <laughs> I hope you fail so you cannot make (laughs) annoying noises at me. Well, the problem is if I like playing this janky hurdy-gurdy, I'm probably going to get a real one. Okay, great. (laughs) So, Postgres. Why are we talking about Postgres? Well, because in recent episodes, uh, not even Mondays, we've talked about how, like, you know, if you are building any sort of modern system, computer system, it's almost definitely going to be just like a database and an application combo of some kind yep. with some sort of U- interface, right, for users, whether it's a desktop app or a web app or a mobile app. And you should almost definitely just be doing Postgres as your database because it is the one. Yep. Right. Now we've done. I'm so, pretty sure we did a Geek Nights on like what databases are and relational. We did a Geek Nights on relational databases, so we're not going to repeat what a relational database is other than to say Postgres is a relational database that is free. Oh, we did that show recently, 2018. Yeah. Wow. I think we, I think it might've been a repeat show. Might've been, I'll search around, but basically there are a lot of different relational database solutions. We're not talking about non-relational databases because frankly, if you think you need a non-relational database and you aren't already an expert in all this, you are wrong and you are about to make a terrible mistake. If you are right. smart enough and right enough to where you know you need a non-relational database, don't listen to me or Scott for advice. That's right. All And the thing is, you know, so the question is Postgres. It's like, well, why Postgres, right? What is special about this one versus the other ones? Why should be this one, the one that you go to without thinking about the other ones? Until unless you have a reason, I right? would say Postgres so, has been the one you should use for most purposes since about two thousand and six. It's a very long time. So Postgres started out as not even SQL, but it was like a Berkeley project, as most computing things yep. started out. Postgres as, is right? way older than you realize, right? And then I think sometime in the nineties they had it's they they changed it up to Postgres ninety five. I'd never heard of Postgres it, till like two thousand three. So yeah, Postgres ninety five was a thing, and then. It finally became the open source project that it is now of PostgreSQL yep. uh, sometime later in the 2000s. And that project is still the project that is happening now. I think, I'm not sure, that when it switched over to its modern incarnation, it was like Postgres 6, I want to say. Yep, I, because they went back to the original numbering. I have not used, like, the last time I used, Pro, like, I used to manage and operate uh high performance Postgres databases as a job. Like that used to be a thing I did. That was something I was paid a lot of money to do, but 
that was circa 2007, 2008, like that era. Right. But so they're currently on Postgres 12. Yep. Like back when I was using Postgres on a day to day basis, it did not really have reliable binary replication or disaster recovery capabilities. I had to hack together like replicating the like the back end stores on DRBD and all this sort of nonsense. But Postgres has evolved rapidly. But the thing I'll say is that in that era, even back then in like 2008 ish, Postgres was already way better than any other free database solution. Like MySQL. Uh, Even the non-free ones. Yeah, like Postgres, I found performed better than Oracle for the things I was using it for. Uh, the other commercial ones, <laughs> Microsoft SQL, why? And MySQL, like, not that great. MySQL, no, my, I mean, MySQL, it's, my, the reason MySQL took off was because... It was easier to it use. Also, it was also free and easy to use. And a lot of things were built on top of it that would would not work with other solutions. Yeah, like, like, in the, like so many web apps back then were like, download this software, download well, MySQL, right, but, install MySQL, had... point your software at MySQL, and the software will set up the database and just work. Right. Before we had, you know, cloud hosting like we have today, the typical web stack was PHP, which had a good connector for MySQL, yep. not so much for Postgres. And... So you would run PHP, MySQL to get your website running with Apache. And that was like this LAMP stack. And that was yep. the stack. And it that stack dying and becoming less popular, people moving away from PHP specifically to other languages yep. that had Postgres connectors is Postgres was better than MySQL even in the LAMP stack. The performance just, was night and day in my experience. Right. And it, not just that, but just like basic things like handling Unicode correctly, like all these yeah. basic un fundamental things that you don't realize, right? Foreign key constraints working properly, you know, supporting <laughs> modern features. I'm, I'm right? just remembering some shit I went through. Right. It's just like all this stuff. It's just like Postgres. My sequel felt very right. janky. Yeah. Now, Postgres you could. Is just, it's a database. It does things the right way, it works the way it's supposed to work. And whether you're someone who doesn't even know anything about the database, you're just doing basic SQL, or you're doing fancy, fancy shit, it, it totally works. I found, like, in my professional career, up until I stopped being at the level where I interacted with systems directly, I found that generally systems that I inherited that were based on MySQL were only based on MySQL because that's what someone set up who didn't really know what they were doing a long time ago. And anything new was Postgres. Like, everything was Postgres. Even in my current job, I've had engineers migrate things to Postgres because it's great. Right. So what makes Postgres so great? Well, first of all, we already talked about how it's free. And how it just does everything right normally, right? Out of the gate. Uh, so that's a good reason to use it. Yeah. But the real reason Postgres is great is all the other things it does that you may not ever need to use, but are there for you when you need them, that make it so that you're not really looking at other tools too much. It's like simul it's like a right, it's like usually you have to choose in the world when you're when you're picking out tools. You might be like, okay, well, here's a chef's knife. It's really good at cutting, and I can use yep. it a lot of different ways, but it's still just a chef's knife. I can't screw do use it as a screwdriver, right? That I need a Swiss Army knife. I could try really hard to use it as a screwdriver, but I might hurt myself, and I'm definitely fucking up both the knife and the screw. Right. Now, imagine a Swiss Army knife, but the knife on it is a chef's knife, and the screwdriver is like an amazing screwdriver, and the corkscrew is an amazing corkscrew. Yep. And none of them might be as good as the best, right? The this, this chef's knife on there isn't as good, isn't the best chef's knife in the world, but it's like, damn good, right? Like no one's, you know, one's going to reject that one saying it's not good enough, Nope. right? It's like 90% as good as the best one, right? So that's what Postgres is. So examples of things Postgres does, right? So for example, you know, you're doing your SQL, right? And normally when you got SQL, you got columns, they got numbers, yep. they got character text, right? A lot of applications out there have to put in some kind of weird data that you don't query with text or numbers, right? Uh, the most common example of this is GPS data, mm -hmm. right? It's two numbers usually, right? Your latitude and your longitude down to a bunch of decimal points. But when you want to query it, you don't want to do greater than, less than, plus, minus, right? You got to say, here's some GPS coordinates, query this table and give me the one that's closest uh, by distance, right? Or, yeah, someone gave me a, an address, and here's the location of that city. 
Give me all G give me all rows in this table that have GPS coordinates within this radius because they're you know within five miles of Scott. He wants to find the restaurants yep. that are nearby, right? How do you do that? Postgres has a thing called PostGIS that just does it. Yep, I'm looking I'm looking at the list because I haven't used Postgres directly in a while. The date there are some fascinating data types in here. Yeah, yeah, it's like so you think that's just one case? No, it has these sorts of things for every case that you can imagine let you know i've seen stuff for like graphs and spherical coordinates and all sorts of other yep. crazy viz or like right? do you know how many times i've seen people put like ip addresses in like mysql databases just as strings mhm mm mhm mm mhm yep. another has thing IP that, address fields. like another main feature like the triggers in postgres are really good like yeah, way all, better all, than like what I would do with an equivalent stored procedure in some bullshit database. Oh yeah. All those basic database features that you expect, views, materialized views, triggers, all these sort they've now they've added um notifications. Actually, no, notifications were added a while ago. Version oh, yeah, 9. Oh yeah, no. This, nine. Right. Right. Yeah. They have they've more recently they've added uh computed columns. So Normally, let's say you have a, a, a table, yep. and in the table you have a name uh, and your birth year, right? I was born in 1982. And you're like, damn, I want to add a column that says how old you are, right? I know your birth date, yep. right? but I, I, need to, I just want to know how many years old you are, there's 30, a lot of, whatever. There's a lot of bad ways to do that. Right, so you could, in the old days, what you could do is you could, A, make a real column and have your application keep one of the columns up to date. I would probably, right. in my old dumb days, either make a view for that or right, calculate it a, in SQL directly. Right, you can make a view that would um, uh, produce another a second table that has the extra column on it, yep. right? And and you would query that view instead of querying That's the probably what table. I would have done, thinking back to the old Right, you could do days. that. You could set up a database trigger to populate uh, that third column, yep. right? But now they have actually just computed columns. So you have your table, you add a computed column, and you say, yeah, this column equals this function This function on that other column. Done. Yep. The, it just have it. Or a feature, the, the feature, other than, because binary replication and disaster recovery, that was added like a long time ago, but the notifications are even better, because I remembered that it added notifications that were good, but now I'm reading details. They're way better than I realized. You can Everything's better. You can replace a lot of the things you would use like an enterprise service bus or a polling system just with the database. You can just, yeah. hey, if this table gets updated in this way, notify this endpoint. Right now, a lot of and a, a reservation I've had as a programmer, right, is I've always stayed away from putting too many things in the database, especially business logic. Right, because when something's in the database, it's not in your say Git repository. Yep. you're not carrying that around with you. That's lost. It's like in this other area, right? Uh, and when you work with old systems that have a lot of things in the database, that's a big problem. It's like this hidden part yep. of the application you don't understand. It's I like, remember a problem work? I troubleshot. Where is the code that does this? Oh, it's in the database. I troubleshot a problem at IBM I couldn't solve forever and finally got the database team on to look at it. And the problem was every time this data got inserted into the database, there was a local stored procedure that would call out to an external service, do some bullshit, and then change the row that was inserted yep, with business exactly. logic. Yep. So what you what I do these days to handle that is I just put all my SQL into my code, right? Ah. So that like, so for example, when you go to frontrecruiter.com, right? If you were to say take the code of frontrecruiter.com and you wanted to make your own website, you'd have a blank Postgres. You have to make a user with enough permissions to execute the SQL, obviously. But then all the SQLs there, so you just type a command and it would build the frontrowcrew.com database for you, uh, right? Out of nothing, including any views that had to be made or anything like that. You know, so that's that the same pattern I uh, used at my last few jobs as well. Like, you know, we sold software, yeah. and what we put together was the, like, the genericized SQL method of creating the database structure, regardless of what database type you're using. Right, so an example, right? So just the other day, I'm working on, because we're upgrading frontrowcrew.com, right? The old frontrowcrew.com had MySQL because it was originally WordPress in the original days, right? Yep. And I got, I got all that data out of there, and I want to bring it over to a new Postgres database. So they have a feature called the foreign data wrapper, right? Oh, the yeah, I was just data, looking at that. So the foreign data wrapper is this amazing thing 
which I highly recommend. Back in the day, if you wanted to migrate from, say, MySQL to Postgres, what you would do is you would do something like dump your MySQL database uh, into a, a SQL file, massage that SQL, and then run that SQL on Postgres to insert all the rows, right? Or run a bunch of queries on MySQL to generate like a CSV or some, a set of CSVs or something like that, and then insert those in the Postgres yep. side. You'd have like a, some sort of procedure that you'd have to do. With the foreign data wrapper, what I do is I tell Postgres, hey, Postgres, there's a MySQL server. You can connect to it on this IP address with this username and password. And it says, all right, cool. And then I say, oh, by the way, Postgres, uh, look at all the tables in that MySQL database and make tables on your side that exactly match those tables. Yeah. And it, says, it says, okay, I made tables that exactly match those tables. And now I'm in Postgres on my local machine. I go to a table. I query it. Postgres queries MySQL, gets the data, and returns it to me as if I had queried a local table. If any of you have been in IT managing databases before where you're trying to migrate from an old database system to a new database system, I think you can right. already see the potential here. And now you think, oh, well, yeah, so one relational database to another, that's kind of fancy and really powerful. No, the foreign data wrapper can wrap all sorts of – any data source. You can wrap – APIs in the yeah, cloud and web for services. data wrappers. Query. You can, so you can write your you application. You can wrap a file. You can have a CSV file. You can have someone's Excel spreadsheet and wrap it, and now it's a Postgres table. So you can write your application to only interact with Postgres now and forever, and then all you your legacy SQL, systems. Can, any data source that you have, you can SQL it by putting a foreign data wrapper in Postgres around it. Yep. So I and get, that's a basic included feature. I guess my advice to, just to all of you, like to kind of wrap up like where we're going with this, is that... If you're young and getting into, like you're in school or you're doing your first jobs and you're in programming, like computer science or anything like that, for one, learn how databases work because too many programmers don't know how databases work and basically re-implement databases in their code. Yep. But two, learn Postgres specifically because Postgres is really well made. If you learn Postgres, you can work with any goddamn database on earth. You can also solve almost any problem. It's like... It's constantly at work. We have all our data in Postgres, and it's like, oh, no, we have a problem. Aha, I have found a solution that involves SQL and does not involve me having yep. to code an algorithm. Like, oh, we have this field included. with a dumb default value. Can we change the default value without messing up anything else? Yeah, in a database, that is trivial to right. solve. You don't think about Postgres as like a place you store all your data. You have to think about it as this program that can solve information problems, right? Yep. And it already has all of the well-known commonly needed information problem solutions built in for you to use. You just have to learn which, prob which problem you have and what the solution is. And there it is for you already implemented basically perfectly. Just take advantage of it. Yep. We couldn't even scratch the surface before getting hungry. <laughs> no you you've, you've heard my things. ulterior motive. Yeah, they got JSON fields. There's search involved. They got L trees. Yeah. Also, the full text search in Postgres is... Fast enough to where a lot of people could use that as their primary means of querying Postgres. Like, it'll actually perform pretty well. Just right. a full text Postgres, search your whole goddamn database. Postgres can even do, like, your image processing for you, right? It's that crazy. Yep. So. If you're going into IT, database management is really important. Learn how to get a Postgres server running and how to deal with it because... It doesn't matter what's in a database. If you're in IT doing supporter operations, if you know how to work with databases, you can be the go-to person to solve like 80% of all problems that happen. Mm -hmm. Like you'll become the database go-to person. That is a really good way to get your career. Like, uh, right. like bootstrap it. And most of the programming that you can do, right, if you're not stuck at some place with COBOL, yep. if you want to make money as a programmer with a job at a company, almost all the code you write is going to be some code that goes between, a, that A, has code to tell Postgres to solve a problem, yep. and then B, takes data from Postgres and massages it to present it to users, and, and back and forth. Yep. That's the code that almost I've written at pretty much every job is code that goes between a person and a database. Yep. Right. Like as soon as you lives. get to the point where you need more than Postgres plus code to interact with the data in the Postgres, you're edging into enterprise nonsense but or even, you've gone down a very bad path. Even in enterprise territory, 
Postgres can still get the job oh, done. You yeah. just need more Postgres's. Yep, more Postgres's, more or you need a few other specialized things that are like Postgres for yeah, adjacent areas. It will, it takes a lot before you would have to have some crazy problem and some crazy scale, like Google level, before yep. you would be having to leave Postgres because it's, you know, right? It's like, not going to cause you problems. Like the next area you would leave Postgres for, at, and this is, again, at giant scale, is things like enterprise service buses and middlewares. But at that yeah. point, you're solving problems that 99% of the people listening will never encounter in their lives. No, never in your whole life. Right. So whether it's your local website or the company you work for, this is, the, this is the thing, and it has been the thing for a long time, so I see no reason it would not continue to be the And thing. one thing I, can, I really want to stress before we Therefore, end. it deserves its own Geek Nights episode. Even back so in, great. like, 2007, 2008, uh, a problem I had with things like MySQL and, like, all these other things was the documentation was kind of bad. Like, wasn't super clear, didn't dis explain. Postgres's documentation has always been A+. Plus. Like, it is it's really— not, I, think it's, I think it's A-. minus. I think the problem— that I have with it is it doesn't show enough examples. Ah, right? uh, that's a good point. Like if you look up if you look up some SQL in there, you get a document that fully explains every option you can possibly give, and they don't give an actual just add an example of that SQL actually being used, mm, right? Okay, on some I see your point. Hypothetical data. Because I had the opposite problem. MySQL and all the other databases. The problem was the documentation consisted primarily of examples, but it didn't explain <laughs> exactly what that parameter yeah, did. Yeah, no, the Postgres documentation explains everything, and then if you if you just do Google searches, the next not page out you find will be examples. <laughs> right? He's like, here's how to use this thing, right? So. All right. So yeah, I'll leave you with this. In 2008-ish, this is so long ago, we used Postgres to run the real-time live transactional system for trades at a major dark pool in U.S. capital markets, like algorithmic trading. That was the performance level you could achieve uh, in 2008. Mm -hmm. It's now 2020. <laughs> yeah, Postgres has come a long way. And now with I really got to get 12. some food. <laughs> yes. All right, good show. All right. Save. Yep, just send me the Firefox show. I'm going to go tend to the food, but uh, as long as you send me the link, I will download it right away, and I'll, I'm will i sure it's going to be fine. All right, well, I'm, uh, I won't delete it from my desktop. Don't delete it from the desktop until I post the show, but assume so everything's going to work. I want to go tend to the food. I can smell it roasting, and I'm getting crazy hungry. I'm also crazy hungry. I'm going to cook a 